Hello and welcome to this video recording. My name is Ross McFadgen. I'm the product manager for the Molecular Portfolio Diagnostic. And today I'm going to talk to you about the Agilent Tape Station and then some of the DNA and RNA applications that are currently supported. Some of the content that we'll cover today, we'll go over some intro to sample QC, the basic principles of the tape station system. We'll then look at the currently available tape station assays on the market. And then we'll have a bit of a deeper dive into the specific DNA and RNA applications that are supported. So firstly, why is sample QC so important? Well, it's really the first step in your workflow to decide if a sample is suitable for your selected downstream process. So whether you're performing NGS or microarrays, these are both highly sensitive assays and therefore they require really high quality input material. You need to ensure that your samples are of the highest quality possible. For example, with NGS, the good DNA library quality helps to ensure good quality reads and this maximizes your sequencing output. For gene expression arrays or RNA-seq, the quality of your input RNA will determine the success of your library preparation and therefore the reproducibility of the microarrays. Both of these types of assays are very expensive to repeat, so rather invest in the money up front to ensure that you are dealing with high quality samples than having to constantly repeat an assay. Some of the sample types you may be dealing with is genomic DNA, cell-free DNA, which includes circulating tumor DNA, and also DNA libraries for NGS or PCR products and qPCR experiments, as well as FFPE-derived DNA. On the RNA side, you might be working with total RNA or mRNA, small or microRNA, as well as cell-free or FFPE RNA, which are tricky sample types to work with. So as the saying goes, low sample quality in equals low data quality out. And there's generally four parameters that we want to measure when we refer to sample quality. This would be the purity of your sample, looking at any contaminants in the nucleic acid, the integrity, so how degraded your sample is, less high molecular weight DNA in your sample means that it's more degraded, and then also the concentration. So what quantity of sample do you have available to you? Is there enough to actually process it downstream? And then also the size of your sample. So that could be the distribution of fragment lengths within your sample. On the right hand side, you'll see a representation of a standard NGS workflow, also showing where the different QC steps fall into the workflow as it progresses. This goes to show that no single measurement is really enough to measure your sample or library quality. So the tape station is able to measure three of these parameters, namely the integrity, the concentration, and the size. The purity would generally be measured by an instrument such as a nanodrop. So when it comes to sample QC, we need to consider the pre-analytical variables that may affect the quality of your input material. Things like the source of the sample, so what organism it's derived from, what is the source material, and whether it's from FFPE type of tissue or bodily fluid such as bloods. There's also collection measures to, to be taken. So if you're working with cell-free DNA, you need to use the correct type of stabilization tube to ensure the sample integrity. Then you also need to take into account centrifugation and the process time after sample collection. When it comes to storage, there's time and temperature, which are two very important variables, more so for um, sample types such as RNA, which require very low temperature storage because they are more unstable than DNA. And then there's things like thawing. So how many freeze thaw cycles can your sample um, go through before it is too degraded and the temperature at which it needs to thaw at. When we're looking at extraction of our nucleic acids, there are a few different variables to take into account. This would be whether the, the extraction process is a manual or an automated method, whether it's bead or column based, um, and all these factors really will determine how degraded your sample is and also the final yield that you get out of that sample. So this brings us to some of the advantages of an automated electrophoresis system, such as the tape station. It's able to generate objective data, meaning that it is measured against markers and ladders of known concentration and size. It's highly reproducible digital data. The systems both enable very high resolution of separation between fragments down to a single digit um, of base pairs. Also, only minimal sample consumption is required using only about one to two microliters of your precious sample. And this allows precise analysis of very small fragments, depending on the analysis kit used. Both systems have a very fast turnaround time, taking less than one minute per analysis of each sample, and also provide a high versatility on the same instrument, meaning that we can use one instrument for the measurement of multiple different parameters and different sample types. 
So before we get into details on each of the individual tape station systems, I wanted to show you where they really fit into the Agilent QC portfolio. So Agilent has a wide range of QC instruments, and this really depends on your application and the sample throughput. Starting on the ultra low throughput end, we have the 4150 tape station, which allows for analysis of one to 16 samples. As we're working down the pyramid, we get to the 2100 bioanalyzer, a very well-known and used instrument for um, electrophoresis, and this allows for analysis of up to 12 samples. On the higher end, we have instruments such as the Fragment Analyzer and Femtopulse, and then the 4200 tape station, which is highly flexible and allows for a low to high throughput, um, and that would be one to 96 samples, depending on the, the lab's capacity. And then on the high and ultra high end, we have the 53 and 5400 Fragment Analyzer systems, which are highly automated and scalable instruments, allowing for thousands of samples per day analysis. And then the ZAG DNA analyzer, which is essentially just a highly automated electrophoresis system, only looking at your qualitative data. So that brings us to the Agilent tape station systems. There are two different models, namely the 4150 tape station and the 4200 tape station. The only difference in the two is the throughput, where the 4150 is capable of one to 16 samples. The 4200 is capable of a 96 sample walkaway analysis. They are both completely automated in their sample handling and injection, require minimal hands-on time, and this allows less chance for human error. Both of these platforms use the exact same reagent kits and provide full scalability and constant cost per sample. So this means whether you are running one or 16 samples on say the 4150, you are still paying the exact amount per sample. So the main application areas that these instruments would be used in is obviously for genomics applications such as NGS, genotyping, pre and post PCR analysis, as well as DNA and RNA integrity analysis. There are specific kits on these platforms for genomic DNA and for cell-free DNA, and they both allow for integrity analysis of DNA and RNA providing the DIN or the RIN-E value, which I'll get to in a bit. The only application areas that are not supported on the tape station would be protein analysis and then any small RNA or micro RNA. These two are supported by the bioanalyzer systems. On the bottom, you would just see a graphical representation of the tape station analysis software and what the output would look like with your simple gel image on the left and then the more commonly used electrophorogram image on the right. So let's have a look at the basic principles of the tape station system and how it actually functions. Um, the tape station separates nucleic acids based on their size using the principles of standard gel electrophoresis. This is because nucleic acids have an overall negative charge and therefore they migrate towards the positively charged electrode called the anode. So smaller nucleic acids will migrate through the gel matrix at a much faster pace in this electric field compared to the larger fragments. And this allows separation of the fragments based on their size. The sample buffer that is used contains the cybergreen intercalating dye, which is a quite well-known dye used in many different molecular applications. And this basically binds to DNA and RNA, which is then excited by the lasers in the system. And that allows us to measure this relative fluorescence of the dye. This then gives us an indication of the size and the concentration of your sample which is measured against the ladder and DNA markers, which are also present in the sample buffer. The DNA markers are simply known DNA fragments of a certain size and concentration. So these are used to normalize against your sample and align them in the run. So the main workhorse of the tape station platform is what we call the screen tape device. Now the screen tape is a small plastic device, which contains 16 independent gel lanes. And this is what is actually inserted into the tape station and where the separation of your nucleic acid occurs. As you will see, each screen tape has a buffer chamber, the individual gel lane, and then electrodes on each side for the current to be applied. On the front of the screen tape, you will have the Agilent logo with the screen tape name of that particular assay kit, in this case, the D1000. On the back of the screen tape, there's a barcode which contains all the relevant information in terms of what screen tape device this is, the expiry date, and whether it has been used before. As I mentioned, the screen tape is highly flexible and allows for the use of between one and 16 samples per run, meaning that you can use a partial screen tape and then pack it away into the fridge um, at four degrees for up to two weeks, where you can then use it again and complete your analysis. This barcode will store inf all information related to how many samples have been previously run 
and when it is actually set to expire. So the user does not have to worry about remembering that information. This slide just has some further information of key points associated with the screen save. Firstly, it's ease of use. There is no preparation required with gels or dyes. It is simply inserted into the instrument and the tape station takes care of the rest. This allows for easy switching between applications. As I mentioned previously, there's a constant cost per sample. And this is because the tape station is able to use partial screen tape. So you do not need to use the full 16 lanes each time you run it. They are highly flexible devices. There are a broad range of DNA and RNA applications available, which we'll get into some further detail in a minute. Incredibly fast um, separation time. It takes about one minute per sample, depending on the assay required, but you can do about 96 samples on the 4200 in just over one and a half hours. Very low sample is required. Only one or two microliters is required, depending on what um, application you're running. For the high sensitivity applications, they do require two microliters of sample. And as I said, there is zero, zero carryover. There are discrete independent lanes which are run independently of each other, and there is no chance for sample contamination. So let, let's have a look at the currently available tape station assays that are on the market. On the DNA side, we have the cell-free DNA and the genomic DNA. These are specific assays made to run these sample types. So with the cell-free kit, you have a range of 50 to 800 base pairs, and it has a quantitative range of 100 to 4,000 picograms per microliter. The cell-free kit will generate a, a quality value called percentage cell-free DNA. And this allows you to measure the exact percentage of cell-free DNA that is present in your sample. For the genomic DNA assay, it allows us to size between 200 base pairs to 60,000 base pairs and has a quantitative range of around 10 to 100 nanograms per microliter. So this is generally used for your input material to really work out the integrity of your genomic DNA upfront before starting your assay. This can provide us with what's called a DNA integrity number or DIN value, and that represents how intact your sample is. On the other end, we have the D1000 and high sensitivity D1000 assays. These both measure between 35 and 1000 base pairs and are commonly used in the NGS workflow. The major difference between these would be that the high sensitivity assay has a much lower limit of detection and also a much lower quantitative range from 10 to 1000 picograms per microliter. Moving up the scale, we have the D5000 and high sensitivity D5000 assays. So again, these are able to size between 100 and 5000 base pairs also used quite often in NGS workflows and also for quantifying and, and qualifying DNA smears or fragmented DNA. These have a quantitative range of 0.1 to 50 nanograms per microliter for the standard assay and also 10 to 1000 picograms per microliter for the high sensitivity assay. For the RNA assay portfolio, we have the standard RNA screen tape and then the high sensitivity RNA. These both size between 100 and 6000 base pair samples only difference being in their limit of detection and their quantitative range. Both RNA assays are able to provide what we call an RNA integrity number equivalent or the RIN-E value. This is a similar value and algorithm used to determine the integrity of RNA samples as with the RIN value generated by the bioanalyzer system. I will get into the differences between these in a few slides. So when deciding which um, screen tape kit is most suitable for your sample type or your application, there are a few things to consider in terms of the analytical specifications of each assay. This information is available for free online. It also comes with each assay kit in a printout. Um, but the most important things I would think to consider would be things like the size range. So what size fragments are you expecting to measure? If you have something that's a lot higher than the 1000 base pair, say you're measuring either large NGS libraries or DNA smears, then you would need to use something such as the DNA 5000, which allows for larger sizing range. Working down the specifications, things you also need to consider is the sensitivity of your assay, the quantitative range and quantitative accuracy, and then also other considerations such as maximum um, salt buffer concentrations that are present in your sample. There are also such things as the, the physical specifications to take note of, such as the sample volume required, and also how many samples are you're able to run with each kit. 
So when we consider the standard tape station workflow, I like to break it up into three separate steps. The first step would really to be to get your agents out of the fridge, let them warm up to room temperature, turn on the tape station device, and then put in your screen tape. This is done first because you want the device to firstly read what screen tape you're going to be using to give you the recommendations based on your requirements, such as the amount of ladder needed, how many tips are needed, for instance. What you would then do is prepare your samples, and this just entails mixing your sample with a sample buffer in specified volumes, vortexing it, and then placing the tubes into the tape station instrument and pressing start. After the time has elapsed and your samples have analyzed, the tape station analysis software opens automatically, allowing you to visualize your results. And it really is that simple. So once your run has finished analyzing, this is what will appear on screen. The analysis software will open up, displaying a gel and electropherogram view of your data. On the top of the software, you would have some different functions that allow you to you know, manipulate the, the contrast or scaling the samples. Um, and that's really just to be able to bring out samples that might be too low in concentration, um, for example. So the gel image is basically your standard electrophoresis gel view. Not that interesting when you're really looking more deeply into the sample and you have a look at the electropherogram. So I would say most users of the tape station are more interested in the right-hand view being your electropherogram view. Electropherogram is simply a representation of the measured fluorescence intensity over time. So kind of similar to flipping a gel on its side, where on the one end you will have an upper marker, which is your larger fragment size, and then on the lower end, your lower marker. And this is where the sample would appear in between the two markers. So the time here corresponds, corresponds to fragment size and the intensity corresponds to the quantity of your nucleic acid present or the concentration. Other things that would appear in the software are just simple navigation panes to switch between different samples in the run. You can either do that by clicking on the actual gel lane or on the, the tube or on the sample description on the side here. At the bottom, we would have what you call your result table. So that would either be a peak table, a region table or your sample table. And here you would just get further information or further results on each of your samples that were run. So let's have a look at some of the more specific DNA applications that are commonly run on the tape station. As I've mentioned, we have the two sample specific assay kits, the cell free DNA and the genomic DNA kit. Those are quite self-explanatory. Some of the other applications commonly used on the tape station would be for NGS sample QC, if you're doing cDNA library QC, or for analyzing qPCR or PCR products. So let's first have a look at the tape station genomic DNA screen tape. So de determining the quantity and quality of the genomic DNA starting material is crucial for the success of your downstream experiments. Some applications require the use of very high molecular weight DNA as input, such as long read NGS um, sequencing, like with PacBio, and this is able to generate a, a DIN value, so a DNA integrity number, and which really provides some insight into how intact or how degraded your DNA sample is. So starting off with a DIN value of one, you would see that most of the DNA is quite degraded, which leads to most of the fragments being of a lower molecular weight. As the DIN value is increasing, that means that the sample's integrity is increasing and the DNA is more intact. So here you'll see for a high DIN value of 9.8, the majority of the sample exists above 50,000 base pairs, meaning that it's a very intact, high molecular weight DNA sample. When we look at the same representation on the electropherogram, we will see that a, a sample with a high DIN value, so a DIN value of nine or 10, will appear as a single very prominent peak on the higher end of the molecular weight um, sizing. As the samples degrade, the high molecular weight material is broken down, and therefore you get much higher representation of your low molecular weight samples in the lower DIN values. So a high DIN value, we want to see um, a single peak on the high molecular weight side, low DIN value, generally a broader smear, and usually below about 10,000 base pairs. So this really shows that we have a single assay that is able to provide DNA integrity, size, and concentration information on your sample. So another use for the genomic DNA kit could be for the validation of extraction instruments. So this allows you to see the quantified value of DNA integrity as well as its concentration. So if you look at the bar chart on the left-hand side, we'll see quantification results from the tape station and qubit and nanodrop instruments. 
and it shows that they're in quite good agreement. You will notice that the nano drop tends to overestimate the amount of starting material um, or DNA in your sample, and it's because it's using a different detection method. So although the qubit would still be considered your gold standard for double-stranded DNA or RNA quantification, it is good to know that the tape station is able to provide quite comparable quantification data. On the right-hand side, we will see a representation of DNA library size measured on the tape station and the bioanalyzer systems. And what this graph is really showing us is the different input amounts that were used for these NGS library prep protocols and the size of the libraries that were finally generated. The dashed red lines represent the, the size that you expect your library to appear at for this particular protocol between 600 and 1000 base pairs. So it really goes to show why quantifying accurately quantifying your starting material is important and also using high quality intact DNA as the using the right amount of DNA enables you to generate libraries of the correct size. So the DIN value um, also allows for the assessment of input genomic DNA integrity from multiple different sample sources, including that of FFPE tissue. So FFPE is um, derived, FFPE derived DNA is often degraded during the fixation process. Um, so it causes chemical modifications or damage to the DNA. It also degrades it, so producing smaller fragment lengths. However, FFPE is still quite a common source of DNA, especially from archival tissue samples. And therefore, many protocols will, you know, provide modifications or, or recommendations that you can follow based on the quality of your, your FFPE material. So on the left hand side, we will see again um, the DIN values achieved from different FFPE samples and then also how those look on the electropherogram. So again, the samples that are on the lower end of the scale providing DIN values between two and three are generally going to be quite degraded and not very useful for your experiment. Then values for FFPE for decent quality FFPE generally are in the range of between four and six DIN, and that would still allow you to have quite a high proportion of high molecular weight material that would be then okay to use in your downstream process. As I said, some protocols would give these recommendations. So this is an example from the Agile and Sure Select XTHS DNA um, library prep kit. And here what they've done is just give some basic modifications depending on the DIN value that you have achieved for your sample. So if you have a DIN of greater than eight, here yeah, you can assume that this is a normal GDNA sample. It's an incredibly high DIN value, especially for FFPE. So there you wouldn't make any changes to the protocol and just follow the standard input amounts. For DIN value between three and eight, here what they are suggesting that you do is to use the maximum amount of DNA that you can use for this library prep protocol, so up to 200 nanograms. And that is because as your DIN value decreases, although there is still some high molecular weight DNA in there, its proportion is quite lower compared to a higher DIN value. And therefore you would need to up the amount of DNA that you input into your assay in order for that high molecular weight DNA to be properly prepared. As you drop into the lower DIN scales below than three, here you would generally need to use all the sample that you have available to you just to try and ensure that you can get something to work. Um, and DIN values, you know, lower than two or one probably shouldn't actually be used for your assay because it's going to be very hard to get a successful result. So this slide is just showing how easy it is to visualize the GDNA results based on certain thresholds that you can apply to your DIN value. So often you would define a DIN threshold based on the protocol or the application that you're running. For example, whole genome sequencing library prep generally suggests that you only use samples with a DIN value of seven or greater. So what this user has done is applied a color threshold to their DIN values. So any DINs of seven or higher will be marked as green, between three and seven will be marked as yellow, and anything lower than that will be marked as red. And this just allows you to quickly assess your results um, and see what samples would have passed above your threshold or not, and then continue and take that information into your, your downstream process. So this is having a look at our other sample specific assay, the tape station cell-free DNA screen tape, which I said is used for cell-free DNA sample types only. Cell-free DNA, cell DNA is also a degraded sample type generally. Um, it's released um, into the bloodstream or the blood plasma. Typically will be in very low concentrations and the size will be around 170 base pairs. And that is just because of how the DNA is wound around histones and how it is degraded. The 170 base pairs is basically what remains intact surrounded around the histone. 
in this case, high molecular weight DNA in your assay is actually seen as contamination and is not wanted for your downstream process. Cell-free DNA is typically used in non-invasive applications such as NIPT or liquid biopsies for oncology. So it's a very up and coming sample type with lots of new and exciting applications for it. So it's quite important to be able to quite accurately and easily assess the percentage of cell-free DNA in your sample and then to also be able to get a measurement or a measurement of its concentration. So what this assay would do is would provide a value called the percentage cell-free DNA. And essentially what that is doing is that it is measuring the peaks between 50 and 700 base pair. And then it is looking at anything beyond that as contamination. So in this case, what you would see is a nice prominent strong peak of cell-free DNA at around the expected size of 170 base pairs. These um, 170 base pair peaks of cell-free DNA can exist as multimers. So what you would see then is in multi multiplications of 170, so 340 and 510, you may see small peaks. However, that's not to worry about. What you really don't want to see in this case is anything beyond 700 base pairs in a high proportion, because this would act as contamination into your assay and potentially negatively affect your results. So if we look at a representation of the gel image here in the cell-free assay, we can see that this one that scored a percentage of 46% cell-free DNA has some high molecular weight DNA contamination present as a stronger band here above 1,000 base pairs. As we improve on the quality of our cell-free DNA, up to 66% cell-free DNA, we'll see that the majority of the sample actually exists where we expect it to exist at 170 or around 340 and 510. And the high molecular weight DNA has been reduced to a much smaller smear that's not as prominent. So this is really the best case scenario. What you want to see is just a single peak at 170 and not much beyond that. And that would represent a, a nice, highly intact cell-free DNA sample. So again, this is just showing a representation of what pure CFDNA would look like on the screen tape device. This is our lower marker. The cell-free DNA assay does not have an upper marker because the point here is really just to measure um, fragments between 50 and 700 and anything beyond that is really your, your contamination. So we only really need the lower marker, which allows us to size and accurately quantify our cell-free DNA between these two points. Um, and as I've said, high molecular weight DNA can affect your library prep in this case. It's seen as contamination in the assay. So as your high molecular weight DNA contamination is increasing, that percentage cell-free DNA value is decreasing. And that is because of the presence of more high molecular weight DNA that exists on the upper end of the, the, the scale. So that could be seen as a really big peak beyond 1000. And what that would do is um, it would override basically your your smaller cell free dna which still exists in the sample but now has to compete with the high molecular weight dna when you start your library prep so if you do have a sample like this there aren't really too many options maybe just to repeat your extraction or your sample collection methods and have a look what could have introduced more of the high molecular weight dna contamination The slide is just showing where the tape station assays can fit into each of the individual steps, QC steps within the NGS workflow. So as we've described already, it's important to do your QC on your input material using an assay such as the genomic DNA screen tape before you head into your, your fragmentation steps. After fragmentation, depending on the size you fragmented to, you would either use something like the D1000 or the D5000 screen tape. And that would allow you to assess how well or how efficiently the fragmentation reaction has occurred and whether you now have the sample type of the correct size. Moving on along the, the workflow, you would perform your standard NGS library prep steps, end repair, adaptive ligation. You then might perform certain enrichment. And then you would need to assess whether the enrichment was successful and again, whether you have captured material of the correct size. Commonly used um, assay in this process would be the D1000 screen tape that's used for a variety of different NGS libraries um, at, as long as they are within the sizing range. And then finally, towards the end of your library prep protocol, when you have your final library that has been purified and, and amplified, it usually exists at quite a low concentration or you might have diluted it out um, for sequencing purposes. So now we generally recommend the high sensitivity D1000 assay. Again, this assay is measuring the same size as the D1000. However, because it is the high sensitivity assay, it has a much lower quantitative range and a much lower limit of detection. 
allowing you to quantify these really low concentration final libraries before your sequencing. This slide is demonstrating quite a useful tool of the tape station analysis software called the region analysis function. This is an example from the tape station D5000 assay. So that's used to measure a size range between 100 and 5000 base pair, ideally used for larger NGS libraries or DNA smears where you're looking at a distribution of fragments over quite a variety of sizes. Um, and what it allows the user to do is set a defined region so that the software only analyzes your sample within that region. So in this case, the user set a region from 75 to 2,500 base pair, and the software has then calculated an average fragment size of that sample of 629 base pairs. You can see that differs to the actual peak height of the sample, which was measured at 664 base pairs. So this is very useful for those performing NGS where you need to calculate the final molarity of your library, and there's a calculation used where you need the average fragment size as input. So this is a very commonly used tool in NGS workflows to work out that average fragment size of your library or of your shared DNA, whatever the case is. It also then provides a concentration and a region molarity, as well as the percentage of total sample that exists within that user defined region. So another application that the tape station assay can be used for would be for PCR fragment analysis. So whether this is for an Amplicon QC or PCR, QPCR, QC, or maybe those doing restriction enzyme digests, we're able to accurately quantify and size PCR fragments. In this case, a 100 base pair fragment was run on the D1000 assay. And here on the left, we can see the JOL image showing how this fragment of 100 base pair quite perfectly lines up to the 100 base pair ladder marker. Here we have our lower marker that's part of the assay and our upper marker. And then the 100 base pair fragment that was run on this assay, lining up at the 100 base pair size. On the top right here, we would see the peak table that is generated for this assay. And here we can see the three peaks detected in our assay, the lower marker, our fragment, and the upper marker. And is also able to give a concentration and a size representing the concentration of your peak. So I want to show you how the tape station assays can be used throughout the NGS workflow in the different steps that um, happen. So for the first step of NGS, you would want to fragment your DNA and then perform some QC to make sure that the parameters you've selected for that fragmentation or that shearing are well optimized. So the goal here is to really shear your samples to generate fragments of a suitable size for your library prep protocol. There are different methods to do this. They both have their, um, their benefits. You get enzymatic methods or sonication based methods, such as those on the Covaris instrument, but it's vital to assess the size and uniformity of your shared DNA before progressing um, downstream. So a successful fragmentation, you would see a nice single uniform smear, quite even distribution of fragments at the correct size for your insert. So the nice bell curve shape seen here. For bad shearing or incomplete shearing, what we would notice is that we still have a tail of larger fragments extending beyond 1000 base pairs, and in this case, actually into the upper marker of this assay. This is firstly wrong because it demonstrates that the shearing was ineffective, and it's also then produced the incorrect fragment size for your assay. This could lead to inefficient library preparation um, and poor sequencing quality metrics as the reads will not cover your entire library. So it's really important to look at, again, the average fragment size and not necessarily just the peak height of your sample. So as we move along the NGS library preparation process, the next step after fragmentation would be the actual library prep. So adapter ligation um, using platform specific adapters, which allow for amplification via PCR, as well as sequencing of the molecules themselves. So it's important here to perform QC to ensure that this ligation process is actually performed quite optimally and that there are no artifacts remaining from the, uh, the reaction. So what we would see in this case is here's our fragmented DNA sample, and here is the sample after the, adapt the adapters have been ligated to the molecules. The size shift is showing that the adapters were successfully ligated as they have increased the, the average library fragment size. For an inefficient adapter ligation reaction, what we might notice are these artifacts are called adapter dimers. And these are where the adapter molecules have self-ligated to each other and are now generally seen around 100 to 150 base pairs and would be seen as a peak in front of your sample. This could indicate the adapter, the adapter ligation process has not performed optimally and any presence of peaks before the library indicates adapter dimers, which mean inefficient adapter ligation 
and this has quite a few consequences for your subsequent sequencing steps. So finally, at the last stage of your NGS library prep protocol, this would be where your enriched library is amplified prior to sequencing. We need to determine the size of the final library, firstly to ensure that it meets the recommended size for your sequencing platform or your library preparation protocol, and then also to calculate the average fragment size, which is re required for your final molarity calculation. Therefore, very accurate measurements are required for this step, as it is really important to get it right. In a high quality library, what we will see is a smooth, specific peak of the correct size, depending on the library prep protocol that was used. And we'll also see no artifacts or side products on the lower and upper ends of the library. For a failed library or for a poor and efficient library prep, what we will notice are what are called artifacts or the adapter dimers I referred to earlier. And these are unwanted side products of the library preparation protocol. And these can have quite a negative impact on your final sequencing quality. Um, diamonds can be removed with a size selection step. However, you also do risk lo losing quite a bit of your library. So for best sequencing results and for optimal library pruning, calculating this final molarity is vitally important. So to wrap up the NGS sample QC portion, as we said, molarity is determined from both the size and concentration. Accurate quantification and sizing of these libraries is necessary to ensure high quality reads and to efficiently generate your data. Any errors in sizing or quantification could result in erroneous molarity calculations, which could lead to a failed or very poor quality sequencing run. This graph is just showing how for sizing that the tape station and the bioanalyzer and the fragment analyzer are quite comparable platforms when measuring the size of a post capture library. And then on the right here, we're looking at the quantification results, comparing the qubit high sense double stranded assay to the high sensitivity double, um, DNA screen tape of the tape station. And although the qubit is still considered the gold standard for double stranded DNA quantification, it is good to see that the tape station is quite comparable when measuring final library concentrations. So now that we've had a look at some of the DNA applications that are supported on the tape station platform, I want to briefly come of the, cover some of the RNA applications that are available. Um, as mentioned, the tape station is able to generate uh, integrity assessment of your RNA called the RIN E value. And this is really useful for a quick determination of your, your sample quality, your input sample quality for your RNA experiments. So whether you're doing qPCR, microarrays, or NGS, it's vital to have very high quality RNA. Um, so this is a perfect use of the tape station platform. And then when you're looking at samples such as FFPE derived RNA, as we said, the RIN value is really not going to be great for these sample types. You're always going to get quite poor RINs because FFPE RNA is always going to be slightly more degraded and less intact than standard RNA. So here we look at what's called the DV200, which I'll explain a bit further. And then if you're doing gene expression studies, it's quite important to have very high quality RNA before starting your experiment. So let's have a look at some of the benefits of using the tape station platform for your RNA QC. So firstly, we're able to cover both different sample types of eukaryotic and prokaryotic RNA. Um, we are able to get a quantification and integrity analysis in a single step. So nothing needs to be done from the user side. You just run your sample and you provide it with both these quality values. Again, very little sample is needed. We can go down to very low limits of detection, down to 100 picograms per microliter. And we're able to generate these integrity values, whether it's the RIN-E or the DB200. Um, so it's the perfect use of a platform for performing your RNA QC, especially in the RNA-seq workflow. So when we're looking at RNA QC, what are we actually measuring? Um, for a eukaryotic total RNA sample, we're looking at the degradation of your 28S and 18S ribosomal bands. So these um, constitute about 80 to 90 percent of a total RNA sample. So measuring them gives you a good indication of the, um, the quality of your total sample and how intact that RNA is. So for a RIN value of 10, what you would expect to see on your lecture ferrogram is quite a strong prominent 18S and 28S peak with no real smaller um, fragments indicating any degradation of sorts. And as that RIN value decreases, you start to see the larger 28S fragment break up and then you begin to see a lot more smaller fragments on the left hand side of those peaks. By the time you get to a RIN value of two, most of the ribosomal RNA is completely degraded and you're only left with these really small RNA fragments that won't provide much um, value in your downstream experiments. Again, looking at the gel image of the tape station on the left by analyzer on the right, what we see is a strong band at about 4,000 nucleotides for your 28S peak. 
and another little bit weaker one at around 2,000 nucleotides representing the 18 s peak. And as you can see, the RIN values for all of these are way above nine, indicating very high quality RNA in all those samples. This is just a, a printout from the TAFE station um, analysis showing what a rat kidney total RNA sample appears like. This is real life data, so you can see a nice strong 28 S peak. It generally appears quite a bit larger than the 18 S. But here we have a RIN value of 8.5, so this would still be considered a really high quality RNA sample. So this is again just showing how we can use the RIN E value to provide standardization of a total RNA QC. So a nice visual representation of a decreasing RIN value and how that would appear on a gel image. So those very prominent bands start to break up and degrade. So you're left with a lot smaller fragments and that causes the RIN value to decrease. Again, on the electropherogram, what you would see the two strong peaks when you have high RIN values of around seven to nine. And as those start to degrade and your RIN value drops below five, down to four and down to three, you get more and more um, smaller fragments. So you'll get a much broader smear on your electropherogram. Again, the threshold for your RIN-E needs to be validated individually. This depends a lot on the sample types that you're using, the applications that you're running. So each lab would really have to take it up to themselves to determine what RIN-E value is applicable to their sample type or their assay. So another use of the RNA assay is not just to evaluate the integrity or the quality of your RNA, but also to maybe assess um, your RNA purification procedures. So when you're purifying or isolating RNA, it's quite important not to have any residual genomic DNA left over, as this could interfere with any of your downstream steps. So what we're seeing here in this electropherogram is quite a nicely intact RNA sample, as can be seen by these two prominent peaks. However, after the 28S peak, we see something else that appears here. And in this case, this would actually be GDNA contamination. That is determined by the size of it, as well as how low its proportion is. But what they've done to show here is before DNA's treatment, they have this peak sitting above the 28S fragment, indicating GDNA contamination. Once that sample has been treated with DNAs, after the DNA's treatment, that fragment disappears on the gel, and that would indicate that your genomic DNA that was left over has been digested, and now you are left with just your two strong RNA peaks, which you can then process further. So we're not only able to measure eukaryotic samples, we can also process prokaryotic RNA or mRNA samples. And just quick, two quick examples of how these would look. So when you're looking at a prokaryotic total RNA sample, you're now looking at your 23S and your 16S ribosomal bands. So they're just slightly smaller in size to the eukaryotic samples. And all you would do in the, in the software is select prokaryotic analysis. And that essentially just tells the software, okay, I'm not looking at a eukaryotic sample. So please look for the 23S and 16S bands. And how that would look in the sample here, it's identified our two peaks, 16S and 23S. It's provided a RIN value of 7.8 because they're quite intact. And what you are seeing here is the 5S RNA fragment. And this does not interfere with the RIN value calculation. So although you would think this is some kind of degradation or contamination, it's quite normal. The software knows it's there, so it's excluded from your quality analysis. And that's how you can perform prokaryotic RNA QC on the tape station. On the right-hand side, we're looking at analysis of mRNA. Currently, this is in development for the tape station. However, it does exist on the bioanalyzer, which is why I have a bioanalyzer output here. And essentially what you're looking for here is the rRNA contamination, because in this case, you would have performed some kind of ribodepletion or you would have rich, enriched your sample with poly T beads. Um, so to kind of pull out your mRNA, your mRNA is always going to be in a much lower proportion to the ribosomal RNA. So it could be quite easy to spot any rRNA contamination. And as you can see in the output here that is given in this sample, there is 0.0% of rRNA contamination. And all we're seeing is the mRNA uh, transcripts. And the reason it looks like a big broad smear is because mRNA um, exists in many transcripts of varying length. So it's always going to be quite a smear. It's never going to be one single size band. As mentioned earlier, when we're doing FFPE RNA QC, we need another method to assess its integrity. They're always going to have poor RIN values. Um, so Illumina came up with the DB200 value, the deviation number 200. And essentially, this is just measuring the percentage of your sample that is greater than 200 nucleotides. So how that would look on the tape station, it's just basically using the region analysis that I spoke about earlier. And it's just giving it a, a value which represents the percentage of sample that is greater than 200 nucleotides. So if we look down here in the results tab, we can see that this sample got a DB200 of 61.8% even though it had a RIN value of only 2.5, which would be considered quite bad for most samples. 
So if we look at that 61.8% DB200 and we refer back to our protocol, we can see here that we are able to process samples even down to as low as 20% DB200. However, anything less than 20%, they actually don't recommend um, for further processing. And that's just basically saying most of your RNA in the sample is less than 200 nucleotides. So it is quite fragmented. So finally, just to sum up what we've covered on the RNA um, QC side of the tape station, this is a nice output of your analysis software after a run is completed. At the top here is where you would switch between eukaryotic and prokaryotic analysis, depending on the sample that you've run. You can see here on the lecture ferrogram, we've got nice separation of our 28S and 18S bands showing nice high RIN value for this sample. And on the left here, the gel image, which shows the RIN value for each of these samples. And you can see as the sample is degrading, that RIN value is really getting lower and lower down to one. And as we can see, we've got the nice visual representation, the color coding that's been applied to this sample um, that's user dependent, but it's a nice easy way to visualize your sample QC. And then the data table at the bottom, which is a summary of all your results and concentrations. And then just to mention again, the, the RIN E value that we've spoken about, it's been extensively validated and this is shown to be completely equivalent to the RIN from the bioanalyzer, which has been used um, for many years and throughout many publications. So you're quite safe to compare RIN E and RIN values in different samples. Just to wrap things up, um, this is just showing really where the TAFE station can fit into a standard NGS library prep protocol. And it's really an end-to-end -end QC platform. We can measure our input material, so our genomic DNA going into the assay. We can then assess the fragmentation as we work through the workflow. We can then evaluate how efficient our adapter ligation has, has been by looking at the size shift in our electroferrogram, as well as the presence of any adapter dimers. And then finally, for that final library, um, which is vital to do proper QC on before sequencing, we are able to measure the size and, and get that average fragment size for molarity calculations. And then we can also look at the, the concentration that's achieved, although we do still recommend the qubit as the double-stranded DNA um, quantification. You are able to get quite similar values off the tape station. Um, so this could be a, a one assay for all kind of approach. Before I end this video, I just wanted to make you aware of a great Agilent um, sample QC series that they released um, in 2020 during the, the global lockdowns. Um, it's a three-part series that really covers the entire Agilent QC portfolio, having a look at multiple different platforms, different sample types, and how they're used in different applications, depending on, on what you're doing. So I would encourage you to go have a look at these. You can go to the, um, the web link at the bottom here. It's called the Genomics to Go series. They actually have a whole bunch of other ones, not just on the sample QC, but I found this um, webinar really useful and I'm sure you will too. Thank you for watching this recording. Um, I hope you found it useful. And if you have any further questions, you're welcome to contact me or visit our website. We at Diagnostic have the entire Agilent QC portfolio of instruments available, not just the tape station. So we can really scale up to your really high throughput analysis. Um, so if there's anything you need to know, please get in contact and we'll be able to find you the best solution that suits you and your lab and your sample types. Thank you.